the number two. And then uh, this is you. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So you're you're also. And then I just put it into. Um, Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issues before us tonight. If you wish to speak on an agenda item, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those wishing to speak in favor of an item, for those wishing to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium. Please speak into the microphone. Each side, those wishing to speak in favor of an item and those wishing to speak in opposition to an item will have 10 minutes to present each side. The time will be divided amongst all persons wishing to speak. If you are here opposing a rezoning tonight, you should be aware of what's called a protest petition. A protest petition can be very helpful to those, to those residents who live in a rezoning area. Please consult the planning department staff for any details on a protest petition and they will be happy to help you. You should also keep in constant touch with the planning department as to when your case will go before the elected officials for a final vote. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Can we have roll call? Commissioner Beelan. Commissioner Boyd. Commissioner Davis. Commissioner Gibbs. Present. Commissioner Harris. Present. Chair Jones. Present. Commissioner Huff. Commissioner Paget. Present. Commissioner Smus Smusky. Commissioner Whitley. Present. Commi Commissioner Winders. Present. Commissioner Miller. Present. All right. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Pat Young with the Planning uh, Department. No adjustments tonight, but I can certify for the record that all items uh, before you, all public hearing items, have been advertised in accordance with law, and we have affidavits to that effect on file with the Planning Department. All right. Thank you. Do we have approval of the minutes? Mr. Chair, I move approval of the minutes. Give me the second. All right. It's been moved and properly seconded by Commissioner Board. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any opposition? The minutes has passed 10 to zero. All right, thank you. Move down to item five, resolution honoring Commissioner Barbara Reachwood. She isn't here this evening, so I'll read it into the public record.
resolution in honor, resolution in appreciation of Ms. Barbara Beachwood. Whereas Ms. Barbara Beachwood was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from May 2009 through December 2013, and whereas the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated effort she has displayed while serving as, as a member of the Durham Planning Commission, and whereas the commission desires to express its appreciation for a job well done, and now therefore let it be resolved by the Durham Planning Commission, Section 1. This commission does hereby express its sincere appreciation for the service rendered by Ms. Beachwood to the citizens of this community. Section 2, that the clerk of the commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the minutes of the commission, and this resolution is hereby presented to Ms. Beachwood as a token of a high, the highest esteem held for her, adopted this 11th day of March 2014, Antonio Jones, Chairman. So we'll be sure she gets this. Now we move down to item 6A, open the public hearing for UDI Farm, A1400001 and Z140001. Good evening. Um, my name is Carla Rosenberg. I'm with the planning department, and I am here to present uh, the first planning amendment case of the year, uh, UDI Farm. The applicant, UDI Community Development Corporation, is proposing to amend approximately 2.6 acres of the future land use map from office to low density residential. And this change would allow them to operate an aquaponics farm on the site. The total site encompasses 5.9 acres, and the rest of it will maintain its current designation of recreation open space. So this is a map showing the broader context um, in the future land use uh, context. The East Cornwallis Road runs diagonally through the center of the screen, and you can see that it borders the site to the northeast. Um, it's just north of an industrial complex, which is shown in purple. And um, surrounding the site is mainly residential land, and that is shown in oranges and yellows. And then it also encompasses a stream, bread, a stream bed, which is shown in green, uh, which connects to the Northeast Creek and eventually to Jordan Lake to the south. So there have been few changes to the land use map, uh, the future land use map for this parcel over time. Um, the Earlier small area plan, the 1986 South Durham plan, um, recommended that the site be designated office, as did the 2005 comprehensive plan. In the justification statement, the applicant suggests that the current land use designation of office ought to be amended because it is not supportable, supportable for this parcel based on site constraints regarding uh, the floodplain intrusion. Essentially, the area that's designated office, which escapes the floodplain, is not sufficiently large to allow for office development. The applicant further states that the existing low and low medium density residential designations surrounding the site are consistent with the proposed land use of low density residential. Staff has reviewed the request against the following four criteria found in the Unified Development Ord Ordinance which include consistency with adopted plans and policies, compatibility with existing and or future land use patterns, lack of substantial adverse impact, and adequacy of shape and size of the site. Starting with consistency with adopted plans and policies, we found that the proposed amendment is consistent with land use policies in the comprehensive plan, including policies regarding density and contiguous development. The first, um, suburban tier density evaluation encourages lower density development outside of the downtown and compact neighborhood tiers and suburban transit support areas. The second, contiguous development, supports orderly development patterns that take advantage of existing urban services and avoid, insofar as possible, patterns of leapfrogging or non-contiguous scattered development. And the third, watershed critical areas and land use encourages lower intensity land uses in watershed critical areas the most sensitive land near water supply reservoirs. 
So the majority of the area surrounding the parcel is already designated low or low medium density residential. And while the current designation of office does allow for a transition from industrial land uses immediately south to low density residential to the north, Staff believes that the portion already designated as recreation open space would sufficiently buffer the parcel from the industrial land to the south for future residential development. Staff determined that there would be no substantial adverse impact with regard to infrastructure, environmental protection, or future demand for land uses. And finally, staff determined that the site is of adequate shape and size to accommodate the proposed residential land use. And therefore, staff believes that the request meets all of the criteria for planned amendments and is thus recommending approval. Um, I'll take any questions afterwards, and I'd like to present also Amy Wolf to present the zoning report. Good evening, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. Uh, the zoning case Z1400001. Uh, for UDI Farm uh, accompanies the plan amendment. The applicant, again, is, is UDI Development Corporation. It's in the city's jurisdiction. The present designation is Office Institutional, and the request is for Residential Suburban 20. The site acreage differs from the plan amendment uh, because only a portion of the site was being requested for a future land use map change. The entire parcel is 5.897 acres, and the proposed use is for agriculture, uh, uh, agriculture development on the site. The site is in the suburban tier at 4601 Industry Lane, which also has frontage on East Cornwallis. Ms. Rosenberg uh, gave it an excellent context of where the site is. Um, it, again, it's in a non non-residential node with a uh, residential to the north and east of the site. The site is forested. There's floodway, floodway fringe. There is a sewer easement running through the site, an intermittent stream. And there is approximately one acre that's out of these special flood areas. The request uh, meets the criteria for the, or the standards for the residential suburban 20 district, which is the lot, lot area and um, at for, at for your information, the maximum height would be 35 feet. Agriculture uh, is a permitted use. It, um, as a proposed use for the site is permitted use in the RS20 district and it's um, also allowed in the RR district re or residential rural district um, at, as a described use in those categories. Again, the site is not consistent with the future land use map. Uh, refer to the plan amendment report for details on that change. And it is consistent, um, this should say no, um, it is consistent with the other applicable policies of the comprehensive plan. And staff determines that should the plan amendment be approved, this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies and ordinances. And I'll be available for any questions. All right, thank you. We have two people signed up to speak, Ed Stewart, Patrick Biker. Both are speaking for. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Uh, members of the commission, my name is Ed Stewart. I serve as president, CEO of UDI Community Development Corporation. I've served in that position for about 44 years and at which time the company was first uh, uh, started. Uh, just one minute of some things that we, might have, that we have done over these 40 some years. Uh, we are noted mostly for our 91 acre industrial park, uh, which was designated on the map as the site for this uh, particular project. Other things include an elderly center for St. Joseph Church, uh, food line supermarket on Federal Street, uh, about 54 houses in northeast central Durham, uh, 25,000 square foot office space on North Mangum Street, and right now, we should, within the next two weeks, we should finish a three-level building at the corner of North Mangum and Corporation Street that we hope will serve to revitalize that area. I, any, any time I get a chance to say something about UDI, I take advantage of it. I finished, and I thank you very much. We have asked Mr. Patrick Biker, 
Attorney Patrick Biker, to be our major speaker. Thank you. Thank you, and I promise I won't take nine and a half minutes of your time this evening. Good evening, Chairman Jones, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham. I'm here tonight representing UDI Community Development Corporation. We are requesting your recommendation for approval of this plan amendment and zoning map change for approximately six acres along the south side of East Cornwallis Road at the intersection with Industry Lane. Also with me tonight on our team is a, uh, a landscape architect with great experience in Durham, Mr. Kevin Hammock. We are requesting this plan amendment and rezoning to RS-20 so that UDI can develop these six acres as an agricultural use that will create an exciting urban farming opportunity for Durham. UDI has secured a grant from the Federal Economic Development Administration to develop these six acres as a facility that can grow fish, fruit, and vegetables. This is a project that will exemplify community-supported agriculture and further enhance Durham's reputation as a leader in the farm-to-table movement. As I'm sure many of you on the Planning Commission will recall, that last year, Southern Living Magazine named Durham the tastiest town in the South. That was a fantastic award for our town, but Durham should not rest on its laurels. Accordingly, this plan amendment and rezoning will allow Durham to move forward with sustainable new jobs and efficient urban agricultural practices that will enhance Durham's leadership position as the food mecca of the South. We thought the Planning Department staff reports on the plan amendment and the zoning map change did an excellent job of stating the issues for these agenda items. We very much appreciate the work of the Planning Department on our proposal. And so in closing, we respectfully ask for your recommendation of approval. Kevin and I will be happy to try and answer any questions you may have tonight. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you. Do we have anyone else wishing to speak? If not, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do we have anyone? All right, Mr. Harris. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to draw your attention to page two of nine of the zoning map change that deals with agricultural development and agricultural use. <clears throat> and I'm looking at the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the applicant does not have a site plan, nor does it require one at this point, but I'm looking at the various uses, the RS-20 and the RR are the only two districts that can have agriculture use, and RR is in the county and RS is in the city. But these various uses that they can do under the agriculture use. And then if I can draw your attention to the uh, page five of six of the amendment, at the very bottom of the page, site concludes the proposed plan amendment would create a substantial adverse impact for the adjacent areas. And it very well could, depending upon what agricultural use they put. So it really gave me concern that, uh, that I mean, we don't have a site plan, so all we have is a verbal and it's not even a commitment as to exactly what they're going to use it. Okay. If I may address that, uh, Commissioner Harris, Aaron Kane with the Planning Department. Um, we sent out a revised version on Friday via email um, that, that corrected that error. So that should have said that there would not be any substantial um, adverse impacts in the city or county. That was an error on our part. I, I understand that, but even with that statement, the various uses that they can use under the agricultural development could cause adverse conditions for the surrounding area. And, and that's just my concern. Thank you. Um, we'll go down to Commissioner Huff, then we'll come back. I actually had a question about that staff conclusion that on page five of six, and <clears throat> and you and you cleared it up. However, you know, Friday a lot of us didn't have any power, didn't have anything mm -hmm. until like yesterday. Okay. 
Thank you, Commissioner Smutsky, then Padgett, then Whitney. Uh, Commissioner Harris, what uh, is it the, uh, the livestock and other uses that you're concerned about causing adverse impacts? What, what is it specifically that you have concerns about? The various uses that you can have in the agricultural district, period. I mean, they could have hogs out there. I guess my my uh, my question is here: is what is it in there that would would warrant any concern other than, from what I understand, UDI and uh, the group at UDI has had a very positive impact in the community. So I don't I don't see anything going any direction other than what it's intended, uh, from what I'm seeing here, and based on what's been presented by planning, I, I feel confident that they've done what they're supposed to do, and 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 that's kind of where it's set. And, so I'll be quick to support the project. Mr. Whitley. You know, I, I'm just thinking about all the times I've cleaned my fish tank and I could have been using the water to, to grow fruits and vegetables. You know, this is a wonderful idea um, and it's happening right here in Durham. It's not happening someplace else. It's happening here. And, and I can't see how having a fish tank and selling fish and growing vegetables and, and plants could have an adverse impact on property around it. I mean, we have gardens throughout our community, and if you go into some of the houses, you're going to find a fish tank. Um, this is something that I think um, Durham could be proud of. Uh, um, UPI has really have, have um, made his mark on Durham and and I think this, this idea is just, it's a step above other ideas that I've heard come forward. I just love this project. And I will ask my fellow commissioners to join me in voting for it. Anyone else wishes? Okay, uh, we'll do. Uh, Davis. No, I'm, I'm going to raise the, uh, you, you want to make, okay, hold that thought. Okay, hold that thought for one minute. So, um, Dr. Winders, anyone else? No? Oh, am I? Yes, yes, my turn. Your turn. <laughs> um, I just, I, I want to see if I understand things right. And, um, it's being changed to R20, which is not an agricultural district, although it does allow some agricultural uses. Probably it wouldn't allow hogs, would it? And the the agriculture will only be able to happen on the residential part, or will there be will they be able to put fruit trees and things in the uh, open space part? So Commissioner Winders, Pat Young with the Planning Department, right? Um, as I think Commissioner Harris or someone on the board alluded to, um, in the city. The only allowable districts for agriculture are R and RS20, and in city it's usually RS20. Um, there could certainly be trees grown on any in any district, um, even for um, not for commercial purposes, but for for growing fruit or other things. The agricultural activities would be only on the RS20 portion. And, and I would just mention again, just to reiterate Mr. Kane's point, the information in the original staff report was strictly a typographical error. Um, we, we really believe that the existing range of uses in the OI district are potentially more impactful than any of the RS-20 uses. So. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Davis, oh, wait, oh, Ms. Gibbs, you have a question? Uh, oh, yes, sir. No, sir, you are recognized. 
Uh, in response to, uh, well, several of the comments so far, uh, Commissioner Whitley, for, for one, uh, this is not something that is going on that's unique to Durham. It is unique to Durham. I, and I know uh, Mr. Hammock uh, has sort of been our pioneer for this kind of thing uh, in the Durham area. Uh, but this is going on around the world. Uh, in my research, uh, I've seen it in uh, Pittsburgh, I've seen it in uh, Australia, and then, of all places, New York City. And, and it's not something that's just uh, uh, relegated as a suburban uh, type of farming. Uh, in New York City, they have enough rooftop hydroponic, aquaponic, whichever one it may be, uh, uh, farms that could possibly feed the inhabitants of that whole entire building. That's something that we need to, and I'm mentioning this because I think it's something that we, that, that needs to be part of the conversation. Our, we've been focusing on uh, affordable housing and, and our uh, uh, higher density development around the county, and which I'd, I'd like to see more and more clusters of uh, mixed use development and this is something that will fit right in. If you have more people, you've got to feed them and this is something that people can do on their own or it can be done on a, a larger scale but it's a, uh, I've been really impressed with it and I have not been able to find any information uh, that there's any environmental issues, there's no smelling of the fish. In fact, you can grow all kinds of vegetables and they're doing that in New York City and in Australia. And if I'm misquoting anything, Kevin, I, you could address that. It's, a, it's something that I think even the planning department at some point, uh, we may have to look at uh, it's being used. There are people that would love to use it in downtown you just ask some of them. Uh, but at any rate, I, I just wanted to mention those things as, as something that we, uh, that should become part of our thinking. Uh, how do we feed people? Because another item that I saw is at some point in the future, it would take a continent size farmland to feed the people of the world. What continent, I, I don't remember. I, my wife would probably say, Charles, get your facts together before you open your mouth. But these things, uh, this is a good, it's not the only alternative, but it is one that does work. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. I move approval of zoning case Z1400001. That's correct. I'm sorry. I move approval of plan amendment 1400001. Now it's been moved and properly seconded. All those in favor, let everybody know by raising your right hand. Case Z1400001 has passed 13 to 0. Uh, you didn't have to uh, go. That was the uh, amendment, the amendment. Which one do you Any opposition? Yeah. Okay. One, one opposed. A, A1400001 has passed 12 to 1. Move approval of zoning case Z1400001. All right, it's been moved and properly seconded. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any opposition? 
Case number Z140001 has passed 12 for and one against. Thank right. you for your time tonight. All right, thank you. We'll move down to case. All right, good, thank you. Case Z130018, Circle K. And before we get started, as a just more of a public disclosure, um, I'm employed with Durham Public Schools, and my home school is Hillside High School, which is adjacent to, I guess, cross street from this particular property. I do not stand again anything financial from this. However, I would like to disclose that as a matter of public record. All right, thank you. Good evening, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. This is zoning case Z1300018. Circle K. The applicant is Circle K Stores Incorporated. The site is within the city's jurisdiction, just north of, of the previous site we just heard. Um, their request is from the present designation of commercial neighborhood to commercial general with a development plan. The site is 2.02 acres. The site is actually two, it encumbers two parcels. One is a, a smaller parcel that fronts on Cook Road and the other is a, is a uh, roughly two acre portion of a five acre um, parcel uh, that, uh, at 3700 Fayetteville Street. Proposed use is for a convenience store which is not committed, uh, excuse me, convenience store with fuel sales which is not committed but a maximum of floor area of 6,000 square feet is committed. Again, here's the site. It's in the suburban tier at 3700 Fayetteville Street opposite Hillside High School. Uh, there is a small po uh, parcel along Cook Road um, that is also included, but this, this parcel fronting on Fayetteville Street is a portion of a single parcel. Um, the, the site is at an intersection, Cook Road and Fayetteville Street. There is a residential neighborhood um, abutting this site. Uh, you have various uh, zoning designations ranging from residential urban 5, residential suburban 8, and residential suburban 20 um, uh, as you head from north to south. The request does meet the standards of the commercial general district. There is a development plan associated with this site that does demonstrate uh, conformance with these standards. The existing conditions of the site, again, um, to your left is north excuse me, to your right is north. Uh, Fayetteville Street is along the south and Hillside High is uh, 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 to the bottom of the page uh, for orientation purposes. There's an existing structure on the side that um, is currently vacant. There's a car wash um, along the corner as uh, well as it was once developed as a convenience store with fuel sales um, and a laundromat. Uh, Fayetteville Street at this location is four lanes with a turn lane. The proposed conditions meet the standards of a development plan. Uh, it shows uh, site access points. It has tree coverage areas in the form of replacement and coverage. And there's a number of commitments that I'll go over as well. Uh, the maximum floor area for the structure is 6,000 square feet. Uh, Again, three site access points. Maximum impervious surface is 85%, and the tree preservation uh, is 15.9%, or that's actually tree coverage, 15.9%. There are graphic commitments, which includes the location of access points and tree coverage areas, the building envelope that's shown, and a project boundary buffer um, on the north of the site that's at 0.8 opacity. There's a number of text commitments as well. Some of these are uh, um, in answer to the traffic impact analysis, which was performed for this site. Um, they are committing to transit facilities, dedication of right-of-way, um, construction of turn lanes, as well as widening of the road for bike lanes along the full frontage of the site of Cook Road and Fayetteville Street. There's design commitments as well that uh, identify commitments for the roof building materials and some visual interest um, along the uh, f uh, side, uh, front and rear of the building. The request is consistent with the future land use map which designates this site as commercial and the site does meet all the policies that relate to this application in a comp comprehensive plan. 
and staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies and ordinances. And I'm available for any questions. All right, thank you. We have three, pe three people signed up to speak, two, four, one against. Evan Walton and Adam Sophia. Can read your writing, sorry. Seraphin? Seraphin? Close, okay, good enough. Um, have those two come up. You have 10 minutes between the two. Thank you much for having us today. Uh, my name is Evan Walton. I'm the Director of Real Estate and Development with Circle K, and we're based out of Charlotte. Um, just wanted to take the time to um, thank you, you know, thank the, um, the Planning Department and Amy for all of their help. They've explained everything, you know, to the, to the fullest extent. Um, you know, we entered into an agreement about a, a little over a year ago to purchase this property. Um, our goal is to um, redevelop. As we know, there, it's, as of now, it's a bit of an eyesore the way that it stands today. Our goal is to come in, um, you know, spend a lot of money on, on revitalizing that corner. Um, we've, we're okay with the, the recommendations for the, the road improvements, um, as well as, um, you know, adding the transportation things that, that Amy had said. Um, just really wanted to field any questions today um, and be here for an advocate of Circle K. We'd love to um, enter this market with a new store and um, really put a, a good product out for, you know, the, not only the neighborhood, but um, commuters coming in and out and also Hillside. Um, Circle K is, um, you know, we're an advocate of the schools. Um, we sponsor a lot of schools and markets where we build new stores, um, sports programs, youth programs, and those type of things. And um, this wouldn't be any different. So, um, you know, at these stores, one thing I'd like to note is that everything, everybody that works in our stores are company um, employees. They pass a drug screen, they pass a background test, um, they work for Circle K. Uh, we hold a very high standard and um, we have executives visiting sites in this market and this will be one of them each and every week. So um, we will definitely, um, from a security standpoint, we will put all of our efforts into keeping that a secure location and really just putting the best offer that we can um, there. So, um, you know, again, uh, here to answer any questions, but um, really appreciate you guys um, allowing us to, to step in here and um, see if we can uh, put a new Circle K at this location. Thank you. Hello, Adam Seraphim with Circle K. Um, thank you again to the staff and to the commission. Um, Evan, I think, put the position um, nicely, but one thing I do want to comment on is, you know, we're not only seeking approval from the commission, we're also seeking approval from the community. You're going to be our customer, and the way we see it is we wouldn't be successful if we didn't have a customer base. So that's the whole reason why we were, we're doing this project, is to be a part of the community. We're not only trying to greatly improve the intersection, greatly improve the area, but we're trying to invest in the community. Um, we're not trying to do a big, huge you know, sheets and monstrosity of a building that's going to shoot lights out in every direction and, and you know, really disturb um, the neighborhood. We're not trying to do that. Again, we're trying to do, you know, a community convenience store. Um, and, you know, we feel that, that, that it'll work for the community as well. So, again, any opposition, you know, we would love to field any questions uh, that you guys have. All right, thank you. We have one person signed up against Sandra Austin. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Sandra Austin. I reside at 1318 Trilly Drive. Um, the south part of my um, property is adjacent to the property in question. The reason I'm here is that uh, I'm a retired educator from Durham Public Schools, and my thing has been students and children all of my life. And I'm concerned about, I want to ensure that if this property is uh, rezoned, that the Hillside students will be thought of and there will be no negativism going on, no Hillside students sort of like hanging out at that property. Um, at the beginning of these negotiations, I was in a conversation with Mr. Pickett and the representatives from Circle K. Also at that time, some administrators were there from Hillside High School and some of my property owners from Cook, the Cook Road area. 
uh, I just put down that I was against it because I want to ensure that everything Circle K has promised will be adhered to. And especially, I'm concerned about the, the runoff, the water runoff from that property to the property on Tralee Drive, and especially to the property owners in the cul-de-sac on Four Seasons. So um, that's why I put down against, but I'm, a, I'm for improvement. But I just want to make sure if um, this zoning is changed that Circle K will do everything that they have said they were going to do. And I would like to have the concentration on the drainage for that to be controlled because our property is going downhill. Uh, the drainage, the hill, the way it's landscaped is downhill. So I want to ensure that. So if they would, that would be ensured, and if there's not, that we can have a redress uh, in order for that to make sure that these things are here too. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Ma'am, are you, do you want to speak? Yes, please. Okay, if you can come up to the microphone and state your name. for my tardiness. My husband was a little bit late. He's actually on the way here. He was trying to find a place to park. We did not want to end up with a ticket. We live at 109 Cook Road, which is um, adjacent to the property. However, we understand that um, because the way um, it's going to be positioned now, we're going to be kind of almost opposite of it. And um, for some reason, our property seems to have a line going down it. We live at 109 Cook Road, and if you look at the little red section on the, uh, the little map they sent us, uh, we're right opposite of it. And there is a, an empty property right next door that was not touched, um, but our property, for some reason, has been rezoned. And we were just wondering why. Why has our property been rezoned? We are not part of... Um, the property that the gas station's going to be on. Who should I ask that question, please? I'm Staff, sorry. can we get clarification on her question? Hi, this is Scott Whiteman from the Planning Department. I believe your property is not uh, included in this rezoning. I believe there's a zoning line that goes through the, your property. Yes. It's just a historical anomaly that you're in two different zoning districts but they're both oh. but they both allow for a single family house okay and what are the um what are the, what are the implications of that please does it mean that our taxes are going to be higher than uh like the people next door to us or i'm sorry i don't understand this yeah. that's why i'm here we i want to know can't say for sure about how it would affect your taxes but typically the zoning wouldn't Something like this would not affect your taxes. Okay, so is that um, a new proposal, though, that um, our property is in two zones, or are you saying it's, it's always been that it's way? It's probably been that way for decades. Okay, and um, is there a date for when the rezoning was done, please? Or is this a proposal to... Um, that is my husband, Christopher Patron. Um, um I was just told that we are actually, our property is in two different zones. Okay. So um, I don't know what the implications of that are. So, so the only property that's being rezoned is the, uh, the property on the map that's shown in the, uh, in the, red? the red lines. Yeah. So ours is not really Yours is not changing right yet. Yeah, whatever the, the line going through the middle of it is something that's been there for a very long time. Okay. Uh, is there a way to find out when? That was sure. done. Yeah, we, if you uh, if you stick around, and we can uh, give you I some will. contact information. We will. I just Thank want to know one other thing, sir. Um, what about the store across the street? Is that going to be anything like the car wash, and is that going to be affected and all that stuff? Rebuilding it. Okay, we'll, we can find that out. Yeah. So what we what we're discussing now is the, the proposed Circle K. Um, yeah, the Circle K. That's correct. right. Correct. So. The question that you have between the property line and that, uh, Mr. Whiteman can answer those questions for you. Okay. Um, you. But, okay, good. All right then, thank you we'll very much. Him, like, we don't we'll want to take up your time. Thank you thank very you. much. Okay, okay. It's no problem. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Davis, well, do we have anyone else wishing to speak? If not, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. And we have Mr. Davis sign to speak first, then Mr. Fadgett, then Mr. Harris. Thank you. Uh, my first question is for staff. In the designation intent, this may be for transportation as well, uh, it states that businesses in this district should be cited convenient to automotive traffic, which is true, and development in the CG district should provide safe pedestrian access to adjacent residential areas. My concern is looking at the development plan. Um, here you have, of course, a tremendous large high school with an influx of not only pedestrians but students who I can guarantee you will be trying to cross the street during lunchtime. Um, according to what I see on the development plan, there is no designated crosswalks on either side of Cook Road or the busy Fayetteville Street. Um, I know we cannot ask the applicant for committed elements, but I think that should be something if we state that we need to have intent on safety for pedestrians that needs to be one of the committed elements. Um, my second question is the rezoning is done because they want more than eight fuel stations. So my question is, is a, a fuel station, is it two on each side? Because that means it's 16 cars. Or is it one pump per side? Or so is it four and then eight? Uh, because if they want to do more than 16, that's pretty large to me. And I don't think it's necessary to have that much right there. Um, the for the fuel pumps, the it's it's a, st a fueling station. So it, I think one um, eight fueling stations. So one pump is two stations. So the eight stations. It was all full. It'd be sixteen cars, correct? Yeah, based on the traffic impact analysis, the applicant would be limited to what we call 16 fueling positions, which means 16 cars could fuel simultaneously. Um, typically, I think they do that with eight double-sided pumps, but the applicant could perhaps explain that, so, that better. But the, the current CN limits to eight fueling stations, so that Limits it to eight vehicles fueling simultaneously. Ah, okay, all right. And the other question about the crosswalks? Yes. Uh, yes, they are, the applicant is required to make a number of roadway improvements, um, including sidewalk along the site frontage on both Fayetteville and Cook Road. Um, once those are done and the handicap ramps and they'll be doing some resurfacing, um, our department and DOT would, would likely look at that and the installation of crosswalk would likely be part of the project. Okay, so I, obviously that's not what we're seeing today, but I just want to go on record to say that I think this project, if it's going to be approved, needs to take into consideration the number of kids that will be crossing the street and the lack of crosswalk showed on the committed plan today. All right. Next be uh, Commissioner Padgett, then Harris. Um. First of all, I want to commend Ms. Austin for her years of service with the public schools. She may not remember me, but she actually taught me in one of those classes. Thank you. <laughs> you. I'll tell you what, you were very firm and very fair. Uh, the next question or statement I want to have, from a law enforcement approach, um, you know, I, I law enforcement for over 30 years now, um, and one of the things as a, um, commander for the uh, school program within the sheriff's office, we saw a lot of activity from Hillside to the corner stores over there. And there was always a, a contention of a lot of problem because of the influx as, as uh, fellow commissioner alluded to. Um, and that's always a concern. And it, it's something that is unfortunate that it does drop with, with Circle K. So my, my statement to you is I'm gonna support the project. But I hope that, that you look at a way to work with the school system and communicate with the school system because it is a big, a big piece of the pie for that corner. 
uh, and, and a lot of activity does hit that corner. So I would hope that, like you said, you do work with the school systems to, to assist that. Um, and then as far as um, the crosswalks, I think that's a great idea. I think that would be a no-brainer for you guys anyway, whether it was in, in, in the proposal or not. Uh, but again, safety of the kids, safety of the employees. The other question that I have is you, you spoke about employees. How many are going to be full-time and how many of them are going to be part-time based on the, um, the, the system which Circle K uses for a store of that nature, size, for the per capita of that area? What do we look like? How many full-time employees? Because I know a lot of times stores will come in, they'll put you X amount of part-timers in, but you really don't get a lot of benefit for a full-time employment putting people back to work full-time. Uh, that's a great question. Um, it, a lot of our new store, you know, depending on the size of the store, that determines the man hours. On a new store that, in, in, in what we propose at this location, um, there will be a store manager, there will be two assistant managers, those are all full-time employees. There will also be a market manager who oversees eight locations. We have a few other ones down the road from there. Um, and so they'll visit stores, like I said, you know, numerous times per week. There's normally, typically, I want to say it's between 240 to 300 man hours per week per store. And at the new ones, they're usually about 280 to 350. So with, with that being said, I would assume, you know, without being able to commit because that's not my side of the business, I believe that at, at, at any given moment, there will always be a full-time employee in our locations. We, we hire first shift, second shift, and third shift. And you typically, especially during peak hours, um, which is a good part of the day, this will be, this will be a very busy store as you guys stated. Um, definitely we will have two, two to three employees in the store at all times, if not um, three to four with one person being in the back room. Um, from a security standpoint and the crosswalks, um, absolutely we, we, we would welcome that. We believe that that would be okay um, and, and we think that that would be best. Um, and to address your concern with, with Hillside, absolutely we would work with them and um, to make sure that the safety at that store is, is the number one concern. So um, that's something that we will do and we can, we can rest assure that. Thank you. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I have two, well, let me let me comment first. At the neighborhood meeting, the community brought up three concerns. One had to do with the safety of kids going across the street. That's a five lane highway where they have to cross because they have a turning lane in each direction on Fayetteville Street. Uh, they brought up the fact of lottering at the store and also with the stormwater runoff and, and landscaping. But I want to ask two of the questions. One of them would go to Mr. Judd and the other one would go to the applicant. One question is, <clears throat> what can the transportation, did he leave? Oh, what can the transportation do with reference to having a, a signal to indicate when kids can cross the street? Because right now, I go through that every day. It's no system. They just go across whenever they feel like they can make it. And then my second one with the applicant, as far as lottering, you have heard the community concern about lottering in the store. What plans have you put into place to prevent kids from, from that being a hangout? Uh, so you should have something already in, in, in play for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Bill Judge with transportation. Um, as I indicated before, with the required roadway improvements, particularly on Cook Road widening, uh, the applicant will have to make a number of signal changes to the signal heads for the additional lanes and um, restripe the existing crosswalks and tie in as they're. Um, so, as part of that, we would typically look at upgrading the signal and look at um, providing pedestrian signals if. if um, yeah, if they're not already there, I'm not sure. Uh, it sounds like they're not. I'm not familiar um, with that specific location, whether or not there's pedestrian signals. I know that there's crosswalks, um, but uh, push buttons. Um, unfortunately, um, abeyance of those pedestrian signals is not always the best, particularly around high schools, so that it does require waiting on the, the signal phase to change, and uh, oftentimes pedestrians. Uh, choose not to wait, but um, but we would include that as part of any any improvement project. 
And also, just to add one thing on that, is that um, you know we have gotten some bids, $125,000 to upgrade the intersection. That's what we've committed to. Um, so that is something that we will do. I'm, a lot of that comes with it. Also, um, we, I don't know if it's been mentioned, but we have committed to adding a um, bus shelter on in front of our site, um, which there currently is not one there today. So we have committed that we would, we would add that on the property. I believe it would sit in the right of way. So it would not essentially be on our property, but we would, we would add that um, as well. To address the concerns of the loitering, um, that is definitely something that our company holds to a high standard in, in our company operated stores. Um, there are some dealer locations that we don't have a direct company operated effect on across the country. This would not be one of those locations. Matter of fact, we have none in North Carolina at all. Um, from a loitering standpoint, we usually use the rule during our training with our store managers and our assistant managers and our, and our CSRs. There's a two minute rule and that's just allow cu customers, some people take longer than others, some people like to go outside um, and scratch their lottery tickets, um, enjoy um, a non-alcoholic beverage outside. And we, we don't want to distract from that, but every scenario is different. If we have a school across the street, the last thing that we are going to allow to have happen is loitering inside and out on our property. It's a tough job for our employee to monitor that, but that's where we, it's our job to employ the right person who can, be, um, who can hold that store to that standard. But I can assure you um, that we definitely take that to the highest and most utmost uh, standard at, at Circle K. Thank you. Have Commissioner Miller, Board, and Whitley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for the applicant. Um, if you could come forward. The current site has two accesses uh, off Fayetteville Street uh, and none on Cook Road. You propose one on Fayetteville Street and one on Cook Road. How important is that Cook Road access to the operation of your? Plan. It is important um, for a lot more numerous reasons than just the operations piece. Also, um, turn radiuses and ingress and egress for fueling trucks and distribution trucks. Um, anytime you can have two access points, it's going to allow for better flow, um, especially on a busier location like this one with the traffic demand that's there. Um, having that ingress and egress um, will only allow for better flow on our site and off of our site. Um, with people turning left and, and right out of each location. So Cook Road is very important. The other thing too is, um, as it was mentioned, that there's a larger piece of property that this two acres is a part of. There, I'm assuming there's gonna be future development there. And anytime you add more development to the site, having more ingress and egress on two, on two arteries is definitely important um, from a site selection and real estate development standpoint, if that answers your question. It does, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have another question for the applicant. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier in response to a question from another commission member, uh, alcoholic beverages. Uh, because of the proximity of the school, is there any limitation that would be uh, imposed on this site for beer and wine sales at, at the convenience store? Well, you know, from, a, you know, from, from looking at it, you know, I can tell you one thing, that our, our employees not only get fines from um, governments, if they, you know, the, the government regulations when they go about um, not carting. We have mystery shops happen all the time. Um, our, our rule in-house is that you, you must ID somebody up until the age of 45. You know, that's, that's kind of, do you look 45 or not? So really what we're saying is, is that everybody that will come in that store will be ID'd. If they're not, there's a lot of mystery shops and people actually lose their positions if, if um, are caught without uh, giving an ID. And with our operations demand, um, we are visiting these stores, and like I said, there's a lot of mystery shops. You know, we, there's people that we let go numerous times each and every month um, for, for not uh, carding. So we will do our very best to not allow alcohol sales, especially to minors, anybody that is only prohibited to do it. Last question, Mr. Chairman. Um, while you're standing there, uh, would you, you, you intend to demolish the existing structures and build a new one? Yes, sir. 6,000 square feet area our building would be no greater than 4,000 square feet and uh, the current building I believe is about uh, some is less than 25 feet tall how tall would your building be? our building roughly um, is between 16 and a half and 17 feet high and I'm assuming there would be some sort of canopy over your uh, gas pumps yes sir how tall would that be um, I believe it's under 21 feet high but, but it would allow yeah. tall built tall trucks to go underneath yes sir thank you thank you mr. chairman 
Commissioner Board, Whitley Winders. I find myself wondering, given that there is a building that crosses the property line, um, what happens to the half of the building that's located in the other property? Are we just going to leave that standing there? <laughs> Um, our proposal to the property owner is to demo both the car wash building and the current building in place. I do understand that it is on the other side of the property. That's an agreement that we've worked out with him um, or, or them. And so our, our position would be to demolish all existing structures that you see today. And also I will note that um, we would be responsible for the cleanup of any environmental issues that are currently there today as well. Um, this is something that Circle K does. We deal with environmental issues both on our sites and sites that we buy and sell. Um, so, uh, you know, rest assured, we, we do know what we're doing when it comes to environmental issues there. Okay. And that's both demolishing and hauling away the debris? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, staff. It, it was mentioned it was mentioned about runoff, a problem with runoff from that property. Have anybody, have that conversation taken place or um, what's the plan of correction? Uh, Mr. Whitley, Pat Young again with the planning department. Um, the, this site was developed originally uh, prior to the time when the city or county had um, stormwater management regulations. So currently there's not any stormwater controls on the, on the site. If the site is redeveloped as been proposed by the applicant, they would have to meet our current stormwater management ordinances, which both controls the quality of stormwater runoff in terms of managing phosphorus, phosphorus and nitrogen and, and quantity so that the peak um, volumes were, were equivalent to what they are currently. Um, at, a, a, at the base year event. Um, I'm not an expert on the subject matter, but our ordinances are, are very stringent and it would be a significant improvement over the current conditions because there's not currently any treatment on the site. Thank you. Uh, my issues have all been brought up. I would just uh, follow up a little bit. Uh, so we're going to demolish the, uh, the whole building uh, I, so that, that means we lose the laundromat, I suppose, uh, that is still functioning, just uh, what would like that confirmed. But, uh, and also, is it a committed element that the building will be demolished and cleaned up? Uh, no, ma'am, there's no committed element to that effect at present. So uh, that seems unwise to Un, to have a zoning a line going right through a building. Is that, is that a question? I'm, I didn't hear it. Qu but your, in your professional opinion, it's okay to have a, a line going, a zoning line going through a building? It, uh, in, it, it happens. It's it's all over Durham, actually. We we just heard from a couple who does have a split zone property. I don't know where their structure is on that property. Um, it's not unusual. Is it ideal? No. Um, but uh, uh, there are. I don't know demolition requirements, but I'm sure that they, from a health and safety point of view, you can't have a half demolished building on your property. I can say uh, on a somewhat related note is the owner of the property who owns the portion. Um, it, it's one parcel um, and the zoning is only a portion of the parcel. The owner signed an owner's acknowledgement form which is a requirement of the development plan so they're aware that the proposed zoning line is through the middle of their property. Somewhat related. All right. Anyone else? No? Just, oh, sorry. I'll let you go then I'll go. Which is really quick. Since okay, so since we have many follow-ups, um, ask your question first, then I'll go, then we'll come back around. All right, sorry. Um, since it's been pointed out that this half a building is a laundromat and you were um, 
committing, well, promising, I should say, not committing to clean up that building. Does that include any environmental concerns due to its use as a laundromat? Because a lot of laundromats do continue to have long-term issues. Um, yes, that is also part of the, the agreement that we have with the seller. Um, and rest assure you, we don't demo buildings that will, on a property line that, that will be taken out. Um, you know, if, if it's a commitment that we need to make today, I can do that. Um, we are planning to knock the whole building down. There are environmental issues with, with um, laundromats. We are saying that that is part of, it, it's part of the structure today. It's not a split structure. So they're together. That is part of the convenience store that we will be demoing. And um, we will not be leaving any, um, there will be nothing there. Again, the goal is to, by the time we would start construction, the, the, the seller is going to um, enter into agreements to develop the rest of the property. So hopefully in conjunction, we'll be able to do our, ours with other groups as well. Um, but we're obviously committing to what the Circle K will do and which is um, take, take, demo the entire building. Thank you. Okay. Got a follow up? If I might, Mr. Chair, um, Pat Young in with the Planning Department. We, we really don't have a mechanism to enforce a commitment regarding demolition of buildings. If this gets passed like this and the applicant, for whatever reason, decides to back out of the site, we don't, we don't have a mechanism that we can't legally require a bond or anything for demolition. Um, it's my professional opinion that there's no way they can operate a Circle K on this site without demolition of it. That's just my professional opinion. Uh, it s sounds like there was some desire for a commitment, but I, I, I don't think we are in a position right now where we can accept that because we would have a very a great difficulty enforcing it legally. So. All right, thank you. So th my questions are for the applicant. Um, so being that I see this every day, five days a week, mm -hmm. forty plus hours a week. Um, what I would suggest and recommend was, number one, work diligently with the administrators and the school resource officers. Um, that's going to significantly reduce your loitering or other activities um, at that store. So develop definitely a personal relationship with whatever SRO officer is stationed at Hillside. Um, second thing, what are the hours of operation? 24 hours. That would be a 24-hour location? 24-hour location. Okay. Game day parking, okay? I'm not sure if you guys addressed this. Um, not sure if you're familiar with Hillside High School Athletics. Uh, some of those games, they utilize that parking lot for games. And that can get really crazy really, really quickly. So have you guys thought about that? Or what is your way to address that game time parking? Um, you know, unless, unless otherwise, we would not allow parking on that location. Um, and mainly reason is, is it's for the customers that are there and paying patrons. Now, if somebody were to come on site and leave a car there for, and we noticed that it was there for a numerous amount of time, um, we would contact authorities and they would either come to tow it um, or we would, you know, if it was something with the school and we were notified that somebody needed a parking space, would it be okay? You know, that's on a store by store basis, but that would have to come from the administration. We would not allow any parking on our location at all. Okay. Just um, word to the wise, I probably would not get into that. Um, and, and, and certainly post signs stating that fact, because some of those games can get yep. parking all over Fayetteville Street. Understood. Um, last thing were, was the students. I know we spoke about underage consumption of alcohol and tobacco products and whatnot. Um, once again, that goes back to my original point. Certainly develop whoever the manager is. They really should get to know the administrators and the school resource officers at Hillside, mm -hmm. and that will significantly reduce multiple headaches. Yes. Um, but other than that, anyone else has have a follow up? All right. So we'll go, with Mr. Davis, Mr. Miller. Then I think we should be done with follow ups. This question is for the applicant, and you don't have to answer this, but I do have a lot of heartburn because there was a fueling station here before, and I don't know, I'm not in there, their financial records, but I think it was of adequate size. I just don't understand why do we have to have more than eight fueling stations when, correct me if I'm wrong, 
a Circle K makes more of that money on in-store sales versus gas sales. I'm concerned because you're going to have a larger footprint of gas stations. That means there's larger runoff. If that's a set footprint that Circle Ks have to have, 10 or 12, then that's the answer. But I really think you guys should consider keeping it the way it is and develop your Circle K and have it based on in-store sales because if I'm incorrect, then I'm incorrect. But uh, convenience stores make most of their money on in-store sales. But you can answer that or just leave it as a Convenience comment. stores do make a, um, a majority of their money inside. Um, however, we've done our studies at this location. And to answer your question, um, our, new, our new construction, I don't want to stick to a dollar amount, but they're north of $2 million. And in order for us to get our return on our investment, um, we, we have, you know, the fuel piece is a very, very big piece. So, you know, when we go to, when we go to look at locations, especially with the high amount of traffic that's there during peak hours, you're going to, that's the reason why we go to those eight MPDs. We would like to do 10, um, but we, we do think that eight is sufficient with our studies. The amount of the density in the location or in the surrounding area, as well as the amount of traffic at you know peak peak times in the morning peak times um, in the evening also football games and whatnot and different events over there there will be a lot of traffic in and out of there uh, in and out of that location and there'll be people waiting for gas and so we you know for peak times that is the adequate amount and it is um, a preferred uh, layout that circle k does for all of our new locations all right i wish you the best of luck thank, thank you. you thank you anyone else oh okay so what, what I'm going to do, <coughs> what I'm going to do for your follow-up, typically we don't do this, but since you was a little bit late, Sorry. it's all right. We'll give you two minutes. Okay. All right. Is that okay? Yeah. It won't take that long. Okay. That's fine. Okay. I just want to ask the um, Circle K members, um, what's the, um, is it going to affect the, um, the land, like across the street from Circle K, is it going to affect the... Um, property lines and are they going to make sidewalks on the um on the side of circle k and everything else are you planning to or widen the road the bigger uh widen the road wider or, or um are you just going to stand in your side on your um, where circle k is going to be located at um, all right per, per the the plans that the the um the planning department has given us um, the road will be widened, not on your property. Um, it is going to be on the Circle K property. Okay. And so um, I do not believe that there's any document showing that, that your property will be affected for what the Circle K property does. Okay. Um, and from an environmental standpoint, um, your property will not be affected from what we do. We're actually going to go in and clean it up um, if there are any issues currently there today. And then we will, we have monitoring systems, uh, state of the art, uh, we, we use state of the art fiberglass tanks and, and everything as we stated at, at, you know, when we talked at the meeting. So mm -hmm. um, we can assure you that we'll do as, be as good of a job as any convenience store operator in the country. Okay, another thing too, we have a dish tier two in front of the house. Oh, it, hold on. So the dish network issues, I'm gonna let you guys talk about that offline. Okay, appreciate it. It's okay. Thank you. Um, okay, just but just for the record, uh, Mr. Judge, can you certify his answer about the transportation, then we'll move on. Yeah, Bill Judge, transportation. The applicant is required to make a number of roadway improvements. I have not researched whether or not they can fit that, all those improvements within the right of way. Sounds like they represent it that they can. Um, so if they were not, then they would have to negotiate with any property owners for any construction easements or right of way to, to acquire those. Okay, good enough. All right, Mr. Miller. All right, good. thank you for giving us the minutes and everything. All right, you're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a lot of concerns about this rezoning. Uh, I really don't object to a convenience store on the site. It's been the traditional use for the site. It's operated inside the CN zone. The CN zone is an imperfect zone, but it is a better neighbor to residential properties immediately abutting it than the uh, commercial general zone is. And while we spent a lot of time talking about how a convenience store might operate on this parcel, the fact is, is if we vote for this rezoning, uh, we will be allowing a whole host of uses under general commercial that we haven't talked about. And when we propose a rezoning, uh, we have to be comfortable with the most intense use under the zoning code, not merely the applicant's proposed use. I have a lot of misgivings here. I don't like this Cook Road ingress. This essentially brings commercial traffic off of Fayetteville Street 
around the corner onto a residential street. Uh, the applicant said that they need this uh, for trucks delivering and what have you, but there are homes directly across the street from this access point. It's gonna change this neighborhood. It's gonna make those homes less desirable as homes. Uh, and for that reason, I would like to see, we already have a development plan in the works. I cannot believe that we cannot make a better development plan to make a better neighbor by cutting down the uses that would be allowed in GC that are not proposed, that nobody says they want, but if they went in here, would be inappropriate neighbors for uh, single family homes next door. Uh, I would like to see uh, cutting down uses. I mean, I don't see, this might be a good convenience store site. I don't see this as being a very good site for a nightclub, but one would be allowed under the general commercial zone. Uh, these things worry me. The applicant mentioned lighting. I have trouble with lighting with neighbors living immediately behind this place. Uh, seems to me a, a, the appropriate committed element could, could solve some of those lighting problems. I'm a little worried about buffering because I know that there is a sanitary sewer easement that cuts through the buffer, which would diminish its uh, effectiveness if the city went through and had to get, do work and cut down a lot of trees. That buffer would pretty much go away. So maybe we could reorganize buffer. My own feeling about this is, is I would like to see this development plan made better and if it took a month to make it better so that this Circle K could be a good neighbor to these neighbors and have a better development plan where the neighbors have worked it out and thought through some of these issues and come up with the appropriate commitments, I'd like to vote for this project a month from now rather than against it tonight. Thank you. All right, Mr. Pageant, and after that, we can get a motion if no one else. Just as a follow-up, I'm looking out there right now. I see about 60 seats. I see three people from, from the neighborhood, and I don't see 63 concerns out in the seats about what's going to do to the area right now. I think anything that we do to that area now is a positive note. What we have out there now, seeing it from a standpoint of, of, of what I do for a living uh, is, is, a, is a, a lot worse. I think anytime we can improve a site, whether we put an exit off of Cook Road or we, we put two off of Fable Street, what I look at right now, I don't see any concerns sitting out there for that as an issue. I just think we need to move on and make this vote and um, make a motion. All right, you gonna make the motion? I'll make a motion that we support the um, Circle K to Z130018. Second. All right. It's moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any, any opposition? Case Z1300018 has passed 12 to one and one against. All right, thank you. We'll move down to item 8A, downtown open space plan. Good evening. Good evening, I'm Tom Dawson with the uh, planning department. Um, I'll be speaking about the downtown open space plan today. Um, first, I'd like to give you a presentation outline. Um, we, uh, and this follows the, the construct of the book, which we've, uh, the plan document, which we've just uh, handed you. 
Um, and uh, the presentation will uh, cover our goals for the project, objectives, and analysis. Um, our participatory design process, uh, our staff uh, recommendations, and our implementation strategies. So our downtown open space goals were, were formed uh, with a lot of community uh, collaboration. Um, our goals became um, what we desired for downtown, uh, to see downtown in the future. Uh, we wanted a variety of open spaces, opportunities for outdoor activities, connection to urban neighborhoods, and design that complements the urban fabrics. So our objectives were to ass assess current open space inventories to see what we had and what was working for us, to identify potential new public open spaces, and then to recommend policy and ordinance changes. So our uh, public participation process was very robust. Um, we started with an um, online and in-person open space survey, um, which covered a lot of attitudes about downtown open space. Um, we had um, several workshops um, that were drawing very active design workshops with the community. Uh, these covered open space needs. Um, teams uh, got together, drew master plans um, for the downtown, which, can, which proposed open space locations and connected them. Uh, and then finally we had an open space design charrette where um, staff selected certain sites we wanted the, the um, teams to explore and uh, we had them draw concepts within those plans. We took the information from the public and then applied our planning knowledge um, and then continuously presented this back to the public through our websites um, and word of mouth. So we've had about five meetings um, to continuously uh, gain input from this community and then um, uh, present our concepts uh, to the community. And we've also met with boards, commissions, stakeholders, as well as our universities um, and uh, within, within um, the uh, city and county governments. Um, our final uh, presentation, um, or our la latest presentation, uh, was all of our concepts and we presented the draft uh, booklet, which you have in your hands, on February 6th. So uh, to get into sort of the, the scope of the project, I'd like to talk about our uh, downtown open space types. Uh, the first type I'd like to discuss is um, public open space. Um, public open space has the highest degree of accessibility. It's owned by the public and largely programmed by the public. Our second type is downtown open spaces, uh, of downtown open spaces, are open spaces at public building. Uh, these are open spaces that have, um, that are, are are very meshed with the architectural program. They're uh, owned by the public and administered by the public, but they have a different degree of access, um, such as um, the uh, Justice Center, so slightly more exclusive access. Um, a third type of downtown open space is the semi-public spaces, and these are very, um, uh, we have, a, um, have several in downtown, including the American Tobacco, we call them semi-public spaces, and they're privately owned, but the public is invited to access them. And then our fourth type is private, um, which, uh, private open spaces, which the plan actually does not cover. Um, to give you an idea about the downtown, um, this is our, um, uh, we are concentrating on a, um, a small geographical area of the downtown. Um, in blue are our identified semi-public open spaces. In orange are our public open spaces, um, our uh, public open spaces. And in um, purple are our open spaces in front of public buildings. And then we also have some major landmarks of the Durham Ball Parks. Currently, um, this is what our public open space network like, uh, looks like. And the, um, the border around it, the buffer, is, uh, represents about an 800-foot walking area. Many of our participants um, in, insisted that these, walk, walk, these open spaces should be very walkable and connected. Um, we get into uh, some of the issues of character, what the open spaces will look and feel like. And we got into ideas about um, civic space that serves, um, has the maximum amount of accessibility to the public and has the, has, um, is tends to take a more harder urban, urban edge. And then nature space, spaces, which um, uh, can contain more environmental programming. So our functions, um, we, have, uh, we want our spaces to, do, to work very hard for us. Uh, we want them to be able to host civic gatherings. We want um, them to be an environmental resource, to host uh, recreational facilities, and also provide uh, degrees of connection uh, and transportation. 
Um, another thing is we want these open spaces to announce um, when you're entering into the downtown, to announce that the downtown is a special place. So with our recommendations, uh, we have uh, staff um, has general policy recommendations on ways we see we can improve the downtown uh, through open space. Renovation of existing open spaces, and we've identified these. We've also identified what's, what's working well. Uh, new public open space, improved connectivity, and then we've, um, the final section of the plan is about implementation and funding. <clears throat> For our master plan, uh, in light green, um, these are spaces we've identified that need a uh, uh, look at or a serious revision. Uh, in dark green, these are spaces that we've identified that could be new public open spaces for downtown. And we've also identified connective uh, trail corridors. Our open space concepts, uh, which, we'll, we'll, which we'll present, are uh, illustrative only and they're to be developed later, but they reference our public participation process. They explore, allow us to explore open space opportunities and discuss with uh, other um, staff they visualize the site potential and they describe the characteristics for early planning of the spaces. So renovation of existing spaces. We've identified three um, that could use a, a uh, renovation. Uh, Rotary Park, 102 West Main Street Green Space, and then Convention Center Plaza. Um, relatively um, simple matter in, um, of the uh, 102 West Main Street, we wanted to preserve the historic um, view shed to the uh, historic Crest building um, in, front of the, in front of the park. And the park's actually functioning fairly well as a um, small open space, almost a park at park. Uh, General Services is cur currently working on um, some of the improvements uh, within this um, park as we speak. Rotary Park is another area that was a um, byproduct of the, the loop um, plan done. Um, so we looked at, um, at possibly um, a renovation uh, to raise the profile on the gateway function of um, Rotary Park. Um, the space is a bit more complex. Um, our uh, main concern was to preserve a view shed between the Carolina Theater and the Armory. Um, currently, we felt that the open space um, that's existing on the site, this is the Durham Convention Center and then there's the Marriott Hotel, uh, wasn't functioning as well as it could be. Um, this concept looks at clearing a, a view, um, uh, having a clean view through the, uh, to the Carolina Plaza, but um, it includes another more innovative feature. Um, when we presented the initial plan to General Services, they um, were interested in um, possibly having a, a grass roof structure underneath, um, taking advantage of the grade uh, change, the steep grade change on Foster Street. Um, and uh, even having uh, an extension of the convention center below the plaza. For new public open space, um, we have uh, identified several spaces, Church and Roxborough Street, Mangum Street, and the DPAC. Uh, and this is a, a large, uh, larger scale illustrative of the, the spaces we're, we're considering. Um, this uh, idea is, uh, proving fairly popular, um, one of the, uh, the concepts within this space is that we have several um, buildings uh, downtown, including the public library, the downtown library, parks and recreation, fire station, city hall plaza, the historic Trinity Methodist Church, and none of these actually really relate to, to each other. Um, it's hard to visualize the site because currently the site is um, the uh, loop um, site, so it's this area here is uh, just traffic islands and there's several lanes of traffic. With the, um, the most, um, most preferred loop redo scenario, this, um, uh, this space would become a peninsula connected back down to the downtown. So it's an opportunity for, the down for um, both uh, good um, park planning but also good urban design to use an open space to connect um, and make this area make sense uh, to all and relate the public buildings to one another. Uh, one of the um, issues that came up continuously within the uh, participation section is the difficulty of getting uh, to City Hall, as you may have witnessed today. Um, we have an opportunity uh, within the existing, um, this is an existing parking lot, to create a front door for the City Hall or a front lawn for the City Hall. 
uh, improve connectivity. Um, improve the American Tobacco Trailhead, improve the crossing at Pettigrew and Ramsar Street the, and the railroad corridor, um, east-west greenway, and then north-south Beltline greenway. Um, the American Tobacco Trailhead was, um, we took a look at. Uh, it's currently um, highly utilized. Uh, we saw some issues with it as we were studying it. Um, both sides are covered in weeds and, and uh, invasive species. Down, uh, downstream in Forest Hills Park has um, undergone a um, stream restoration, but if you do downstream and you don't do upstream, then um, so, we, so we proposed um, an upstream reno renovation to um, complement the trail, uh, the existing American Tobacco Trail. Um, the Durham Performing Arts Center, um, highly successful, uh, but it has no landscape in front of it. Um, so we have uh, a great uh, Durham amenity, um, and it's viewed through, um, through a parking lot and a, and a grassy field, so we're proposing a landscape in front of it. Uh, one of the uh, ideas about connectivity is to uh, create a links between um, the downtown and the American Tobacco Campus uh, with um, the downtown and connecting to the Beltline um, uh, area to the belt, potential Beltline Trail uh, that runs to the north and the south. We wanted to do this through um, uh, what's termed road dieting, and if Bill judges still, um, a road dieting, and um, also a connection over the existing trail, uh, rail trestle. And this is an example of what we'd be proposing for Ramsar Street, where we take out a quarter mile of turn lane um, and then install um, bicycle and pedestrian paths uh, and streetscaping. So our existing uh, public open spaces, what we're, this is um, what is, is currently existing, and um, this is more representative of what, we're, um, what we could do um, with this plan. Uh, one other aspect is we've uh, looked at um, semi-public open spaces and how to increase those as they develop in large, um, large lot parcels of over four acres. So, Currently, we've projected um, we have about 23 acres of um, semi-public open space, uh, open space of public buildings, and then public open space. Uh, we have a population that may double in size by 2016. We're looking at a um, large increase um, to uh, to fulfill the demand of the uh, downtown um, downtown population increase and its popularity as a tourist destination and as a gathering for all of uh, Durham. So with our implementation strategies, we're coordinating continuously with other departments, prioritize recommendations, earmarking residential uh, impact fees to be spent downtown. Um, we're proposing UDO requirements for semi-public open space on light, uh, sites larger than four acres, and we're looking at open space improvements within the CIP. And also, once we have the plan, we can begin to seek grants for these spaces. And I'll open for, I'll open for questions at the time. All right, thank you. Any, so we have uh, Mr. Davis. I uh, haven't looked at the whole thing, but with the development of areas for open space, uh, the initial cost and the maintenance concern me. Has there been any look at zero scaping or native plants that would be advantageous for us to put here? Because I know the city of Durham is great, but the grounds would be pretty uh, extensive in trying to maintain all these future open space sites. As a landscape architect, you're speaking my language. Okay. Um, we've, uh, I think with um, that actually has not been um, been addressed um, because we wanted to leave a lot of this uh, to the to the next phase, to more the design phase, but xeriscaping is part of good, and low maintenance planning is, is a, is a uh, good policy for down, for downtown and urban areas. Yeah, I just, when we look at trying to get funding, I mean, I know the initial cost is probably higher, but, you know, the long life cycle would be more advantageous. So yeah. if that's put into the wording on grant funding, I think it might um, be a good idea. Yeah, w we've also been um, uh, reminded by the Parks Department that maintenance is, is an ongoing issue and should be included as part of the st any strategy we have for open space. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Whitley. Um, thank you for bringing this to us. Now, I often thought that um, 
the open space would be somewhere past Morgan to um, um, I mean, it was going north to downtown. But here you're taking space, you're suggesting space downtown as the focus. It looks pretty, but I've also thought, and since I've been here on the Planning Commission, that we haven't paid enough attention to parking, you know? And so the, my question to you is, how is this gonna impact parking? Excellent, excellent question, sir. We've, um, we've coordinated with the parking study um, that's ongoing for downtown, and of course also with transportation. Um, one of the, um, uh, the, I believe, trends in downtown parking is structured parking rather than surface level parking. Uh, so, but there are occasions within the concept of the plan where we've looked at um, potential areas that could serve um, a multimodal function such as at the train station and it, there might be a suitable for parking. But I think parking is um, one of those issues that the, um, as we look at in the future, we're, we're going to, um, as a community, look at should a space be continue to be surface level parking or should, can it serve um, a greater good by becoming open space? Um, so those are some of the issues that we've continuously been, been weighing in the downtown. Um, this is also, um, the plan does come from the planning department, so we, we do deal with parking issues and development issues all the time. Um, so it's a, we have considered it, sir. I think I'm at the same place that um, you started when you started your explanation. So we really haven't figured out um, what we're going to do with parking. Is that the gist of everything you've said? If I may, Sarah Young with the planning department. One of the things that we've done in this plan, um, and I don't know how much you all know about it, is downtown um, and 9th Street were recently uh, the subjects of a pretty intensive parking study by the transportation department. For downtown, that study identified two specific sites for new parking structures. Those are the two uh, empty parking lots along Morgan Street right now. So one of the things that we were very conscientious about was making sure to not propose anything for those two sites. So in theory, the issue of parking, future parking demand for decades to come has already been addressed through that study and we've coordinated with that. So none of our recommendations um, you know, step on the toes of the parking study. Okay, uh, let me give this. So I'm gonna have to get out of my car and walk more. And yes, I sir. Think, and I think my doctor must have called you and told you to <laughs> tell me that. I'm sure if my wife is listening, she's saying, you're right. Um, but that's the plan, is, is to take advantage of open space and, and to uh, move traffic someplace else. Um. I believe the plan is to work with traffic, but also right size, uh, include um, pedestrians and bicyclists as traffic. Um, so that's the tack that we're taking. We want people to be, have the opportunity to walk more, but we don't necessarily... Um, walk the line. Yeah. Walk the line. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Oh, Ms. Uh, Huff and Gibbs. Uh, just one question. The, the railroad trestle? over uh, Chapel Hill Street. Do we own that? No, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Gibbs. Well, I just have a, a brief comment on this. It, if you look into uh, in depth in this plan, and by the way, well, I've seen it before, but I'll tell you again, this is, this is a great plan, and I commend the planning department for this. But this, there are a lot of things that have to be coordinated within this thing. It's uh, from, there, there could be streets uh, re, uh, reconfigured. Uh, we still don't know what's gonna happen with the railroad tracks. But basically, uh, 
this plan will coordinate well with that. And that word coordinate is something you need to keep in mind. I'm, I'm speaking to, the, to all of us, to everybody, I guess, within earshot. There, there is an awful lot of things still left to be done to make all coordinated, to bring all this stuff together to work. Uh, and I do not envy the task of the planning department in doing this, but I think you can count on on us and everybody else to for input uh, and help. But uh, this is a great plan. Uh, and I uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right. This doesn't require a vote. It's just more informational. So we don't have any questions. Thank you. Is that yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair, members of the um, Planning Commission, we, we will be coming back next month asking for a recommendation. So this was really just an attempt to get you exposed to the issues, make sure we answer any of your questions, mm -hmm. and then we will be back next month. Uh, with a much briefer overview and ask for a vote. I think you. Yeah, okay. Probably gonna happen in, uh, All right. So yeah. So take the next month and kind of look yeah, through this uh, nice, beautiful publication. And come with any recommendations next month. All right. Thank you. Do we have any announcements? What do we have next month, Scott? We have the just mentioned a public hearing for the Durham open space plan, uh, downtown open space plan. We have another comprehensive planning project, which whose name I can't remember at the moment, and one zoning case. Okay, good. Any other announcements? No. Well, if all hearts and minds are clear, we'll adjourn.